Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled down to the earth and his angels with him. This was written at the end of the first century and was included in the canon of the New Testament. The ancient serpent called the devil or Satan cast down from heaven. What does this mean and how did we get here? Let's go back to the beginning. The oldest text that mentions the name Satan is from the book of Job. And in this text, Satan is not this divine opposition underworld king that he's later depicted in late antiquity by both Jews and Christians and Muslims. But instead, he's more of a district attorney for El Jehovah. And he's talking to El Jehovah about Job and why Job worships him because he has so much wealth. And if you take away his wealth, then he won't worship you. And anyways, long story short, this old depiction of Satan is not at all in line with the Satan that we just heard from in Revelation. In fact, the serpent in the garden is never mentioned as being the same thing as Satan. If the serpent in the garden was cast out of Eden along with Adam and Eve, then there's no way he can possibly be in the later scene for Job, which makes no sense. So how do we get from Satan as some district attorney character who's aligning himself with the sons of God and the serpent character who is cast out of paradise with Adam and Eve? And how do we get from those to being two separate things to this depiction of a war breaking out where the great dragon ancient serpent called the devil or Satan is cast down. Where is Lucifer in all of this? Ancient Serpent. The Egyptian Book of the Dead dates back to the second millennium BCE, before the collapse of the Bronze Age. There is a text titled, The Chapter of the Making of the transformation into the serpent Seta, the chancellor in chief, new, triumphant, says, I am the serpent Seta, whose years are many. I die and I am born again each day. I am the serpent Seta, which dwelleth in the uttermost parts of the earth. I die and I am born again and I renew myself, and I grow young each day. You might actually be surprised to discover that this is not the oldest for the image of the serpent to be connected with rebirth, immortality, healing. This is an idea that traces itself back to the Bronze Age, Black Sea region, the Pelasgians inhabit the world of Greece, Rome, Northern Africa after the collapse of the Bronze Age. These myths are retold in the stories of Medea. The Draconess of Medea were a pair of serpents which drew the flying chariot of the witch Medea. She summoned them to carry her away from Corinth following the murder of King Creon his daughter, Glauke, and her children by Jason. Diodorus of Sicily says that she was posing as a priest of Artemis. Artemis has the title Luciferia. She is also the brother of Apollo, who is the brilliant one, the light bringer and god of music, poetry, beauty, prophecy. Diodorus says, she, Medea, posing as a priestess of Artemis, declared to King Peleus that Artemis, riding through the air upon a chariot drawn by Draconis, 
had flown in the air over many parts of the inhabited earth, had chosen the realm of the most pious king in all the world for the establishment of her own worship and for honors, which she be forever and ever by means of certain drugs. Medea caused shapes of Dracones to appear, which she declared had brought the goddess through the air from the Hyperboreans to make her stay with Pelias. Hyperboreans are a mythical race of people from the land of the Scythia. This signifies this is an ancient myth brought to the Greeks from previous time. You also have the god Set, an Egyptian deity, identified with Typhon. He is the god of deserts, storms, disorder, violence, and foreigners. Set originally had a positive role where he accompanies Ra on his bark to repel Apep, the serpent of chaos. However, during an intermediate dynasty, Set's role would drastically change as he became identified with the storm god Typhon. He became the devil. Which brings us to Angramanu, another Middle Eastern deity, also known as Ariman, who is called the devil as well. He is seen as the evil god in the cosmology of Zoroastrianism. He is just as powerful as the good god of light, Ahura Mazda. In the Zen Vesta, Zoroaster is traveling through the desert, once again, set in the desert. But Angramanu rushes up on him, and Angramanu asks Zoroaster to give up the worship of Ahura Mazda, and to worship him, and that if he worships him, he will be given all the boons of the world, the great boon to rule all the nations. Zoroaster declines and begins to chant in honor of Ahura Mazda and Angormanu is banished by these chants. The story seems very familiar to the Gospel of Matthew when Jesus is in the desert and is tempted by the devil in the wilderness. Zoroastrianism brings this divide in the world of mythology between good gods and bad gods, the devil and the god. This divide is seen all throughout the world. In Hinduism, you have the Devas and the Asuras. In Greek mythology, you have Olympians and Titans. Which brings us to Saturn. These ideas go back to the Sumerians with Enlil and Enki. Enlil, who wants to flood the world, he's tired of human beings, is betrayed by Enki, who rather tells humans how to survive the wrath of Enlil. This story is reflected in both Noah's Ark but also Deucalion being told by Prometheus to build an ark because Zeus is going to flood the world. This brings us to the myth of Saturn. When I mentioned Medea and the serpents as symbols of healing and rebirth and immortality, this was the world of the Saturnian Bronze Age. These myths are retold by Hesiod and Homer. Saturn's name is derived from Satas, meaning sowing. And in late antiquity, Saturn would become synchronized with a number of deities. Cicero says that Saturn represent the power which maintains the cyclic course of times and seasons. This is the sense that the Greek name of the god bears, for he is called Cronus, which is the same as Kronos or time. Saturn, for his part, got his name because he was sated with the years. He is the son of heaven who kills his father Aranos to take on the throne and become the king of the universe. After being told by an oracle that his son would usurp him the same way he usurps his father, he begins to eat his children so that none of them could ever usurp him. Hesiod's Theogony states Kronos, after castrating his father Uranos, becomes the supreme ruler of the cosmos and weds his sister Rhea, by whom he begets three daughters and three sons, Hestia, Demeter, Hera, Hades, and Poseidon. And lastly, wise Zeus, the youngest of the six. 
He swallows each child as soon as they are born, having received a prophecy from his parents Gaia and Uranos, that one of his children is destined to one day overthrow him as his father. This causes Rhea increasing grief, and upon becoming pregnant with her sixth child, Zeus, she approaches her parents Gaia and Uranos, seeking a plan to save her child and bring retribution to Cronus. Following her parents' instructions, she travels to Lictus in Crete, where she gives birth to Zeus, handing the newborn child over to Gaia for her raise, and Gaia takes him to a cave on Mount Aegean. Rhea then gives to Cronus, in the place of the child, a stone wrapped in swaddling clothes, which he promptly swallows, unaware that it isn't his son. What does this have to do with Satan and the devil, Hades, Poseidon, and Zeus? All three of them would become rulers of a certain realm. Hades is the king of the underworld, Poseidon, the king of the sea, and Zeus, the king of the heavens, as he usurps Saturn. Saturn, however, would go on to rule a specific part of the underworld known as Elysium. This is the special part of Hades for people who attained a specific immortality from transmigration of the soul. So Saturn becomes the ruler and king of Hades with his son Hades, also known as Pluto. In the religion of Orphism, these gods are heavily invoked in the hymns. Revelation 20, 13 says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And there were open books, and one of them was the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their deeds, as recorded in the books. Then the sea gave up its dead, and then death and Hades gave up their dead. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. These are pagan gods that are invoked in the Orphic hymns, being casted into the lake of fire in Revelation, the same book that mentions the great serpent, Satan, being cast down as well. This is there for a reason. Hades or Pluto, the Greek underworld god as I've mentioned, often conflated with Plutos, the god of wealth. Perhaps this is the reason why Satan in the desert is always offering wealth, always tempting with wealth. However, the god Dis Potter, the Roman underworld god equivalent of Pluto, who is often synced with Bacchus, father of the riches, Cicero calls him. He has the power to possess and give spirits to those who drink the wine in the ceremonies. In Dante's Divine Comedy, there is a location known as the City of Dis, which comprises Lower Hell. This is a play on the father Dis Potter. He is also associated with Jupiter. This underworld god is the king of all the pagan gods. Father Liber in the Roman religion, the free father, the god of wine, male fertility and freedom, is the Roman equivalent of Dionysus and Bacchus. And after the spread of Hellenism, in fact, their mythologies would become one and the same. As Hellenism was spreading west, the conservatives from the old Etruscan religion rejected Bacchus. There was a decree laid out in the Senate, the suppression of Bacchus worship in 186 BCE. Shortly after the end of the Second Punic War, Livy tells us that a Bacchanalia's introduction by a foreign soothsayer, a Greek mean condition, a low operator of sacrifices, the cult spread in secret like a plague. The lower classes, plebs, women, the young, morally weak and effeminate males are particularly susceptible. All such persons, fickle, uneducated minds, 
but even Rome's elite are not immune. The Bacchanalia's priestesses urge their deluded flock to break all social and sexual boundaries, even to visit ritual murder on those who oppose them or betray their secrets. But a loyal servant reveals all to a shocked Senate whose quick thinking, wise actions, and piety save Rome from the divine wrath and disaster it would otherwise have suffered. Notice the demonization of Bacchus worship already happening in Rome in the second century BCE. According to James Fraser, Bacchus, who's also identified with Osiris from Egypt, is depicted as a goat like Pan. He's also depicted as a bull with horns. Here we have the idea of an evil horn god who's none other than Bacchus himself. In Egypt, he is the son of Amon, who's also king of the universe like Father Liber and Dis Pater in Rome. He's depicted with horns and he is the direct rival of Typhon. Ovid's Metamorphosis, written in the first century BCE, relays exactly this scene. He says, How Typhon, issuing from Earth's lowest depths, struck terror in those heavenly hearts, and they all turned their backs and fled until they found refuge in Egypt and the seven mouthed Nile. She told how earth born Typhon, even there, pursued them, and the gods concealed themselves in spurious shapes. And Jove became a ram, lord of the herd, she said. And so today, the great Libyan Amons shone with curling horns. Phobus, Apollo, hid as a raven. Bacchus, a goat. Phoebe, a cat. Juno, a snow-white cow. Venus, a fish. And Mercury, an ibis. The muse Calliope, who is the mother of Orpheus, retells this tale, just as she tells of the rape of Persephone. And in the rape of Persephone, Hades, the underworld god, as I've introduced to you, comes up in a chasm and takes down Persephone, daughter of Demeter. And as she's brought down into the underworld, she takes a bite of the pomegranate. And because of this, she is not allowed to leave. And she becomes the queen of the underworld as married to Hades, otherwise known as Father Dis. The myths of Dionysus tell us that he is the son of Persephone. However, this has its roots not only in Egypt, but all over the Black Sea region of this Chthonian Dionysus. The precursor to Dis Pater, the underworld Zeus or Chthonian Dionysus goes back to the Bronze Age. Dionysus is one of the earliest known gods with archeological evidence supporting worship of this wine god dating back to 1300 BCE and beyond with the god's name appearing on clay tablets in the palace of Nestor in Pylos. Some researchers speculate that Hades was originally the Chthonian aspect of Dionysus. Also, Diodorus tells us that this is part of the secrets of the Eleusinian mysteries, which is why we don't know about this in any myths. This was secret information for initiates only. The theory is supported by a Homeric hymn to Demeter, in which Demeter refuses to drink wine, associating it with the god who abducted her daughter, Persephone, as well as two reliefs found in marble votives from the 4th century depicting Persephone and Dionysus as married. In the Orphic tradition, Hades and Dionysus are linked in a different way 
with the advent of Zagreus. Zagreus is Persephone's son by Zeus, and this myth Hades is views as the Chthonic aspect of Zeus, and they were considered interlinked. All of this is going to matter when I get to my conclusion. But first, I want to talk about Pan. Pan is the god of the wild, shepherds, and flocks. Rustic music, often depicted with goat horns, goat legs, and playing the flute. He's also affiliated with sex. Because of this, Pan is connected to fertility and the season of spring. And just like the serpent, he brings rebirth and resurrection. Pan means all in Greek. And just like how I mentioned with Dionysus being depicted or being connected with both Zeus and the underworld, Chthonic Hades, Pan also is considered to be an aspect of Jupiter and also an aspect of Bacchus. So Pan, being a rustic god, was not worshipped in temples or built edifices but in natural settings like caves and grottoes and the slopes of mountains and acropolises of Athens. In Israel, in the Galilee, there is a grotto of Pan known as Banias. I was there myself and the tradition says that this is the opening to Hades. And this is where Pan is also linked with Hades himself being ca called the king of the underworld and his gateway to the underworld was right here in Israel. Pan also battles with Typhon. In the myths of Pan, he's born in Crete. Pan aided his father and brother in battle with the Titans by letting out a horrible screech and scattering them in terror. This is where Pan becomes the image of the devil. You might have heard of Pan's labyrinth and thought of this equivalency with the devil and hell. This is an ancient tradition that Strabo in his geography relates to us. In book 17 of Strabo's geography, when he's writing about Egypt, he says, As far as Cyane and Elephantine, there are the Thebes guard station and the canal that leads to Tanis, and then Lycanopolis, Aphrodite's, and the city of Pan, an old settlement of linen and stone workers. He then later on says in the next paragraph, there is also a well that lies at a great depth, so that one goes down to it, a monolithic curved vaults of outstanding size and workmanship. There is a canal that leads to the place from the great river and around the canal is the grove of the Egyptian Acanthus, sacred to Apollo. Abydos, to have been a great city at one time, second only to Thebes. Today, it is a small settlement. If, as they say, Memnon is called Ismandis by the Egyptians, the labyrinth would also be Memnonion, and a work of the same person as those in Abydos and in Thebes, for they say there are certain Memnonia there. Beyond Abydos is the first of the three previously mentioned, the oasis of Ammon in Libya, which is seven days distance through the desert. In this settlement, there is an abundance of water and wine, the second is around Lake Morris, and the third is around the Oracle of Amon. Much has been said about Amon. So we have a city of Pan described as a labyrinth, Pan's Labyrinth, but also it is located in a place called Abydos. I find it interesting that this city called Abydos is sacred to Apollo, when in Book of Revelation, in verse 11 of chapter 9, it says, A king, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek, Apollyon, which means destroyer. The bottomless pit being identified with the devil. 
We see in these both locations, in Pan's Labyrinth in Egypt and in Pan's Grotto in Israel, there is a path to the bottomless pit, the gateway to Hades, the key of the abyss. In Revelation 20, I saw an angel come down out of heaven having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until a thousand years were ended. Pan is also very much linked with Apollo, as the Strabo relates to us. In Ovid's Metamorphosis, throughout the tales, we're constantly being reminded that Pan, who plays the flute, is hanging out with Apollo, who plays the lyre. This brings us to the topic of Lucifer. Apollo, whose epithet is Phobos, which literally means bright, and his sister Diana, or Artemis, who is known as Lucifera, Lightbringer, very much reflect the idea of Venus and Lucifer. The planet Venus is Lucifer, the Lightbringer, and Lucifer, according to Hesiod, is Eosphoros, the bringer of the dawn. Nowhere in any Greek or Roman mythology is Eosphoros or Lucifer evil or doing anything considered evil. He's exactly the opposite. He brings the light and salvation. But how does the devil get acquainted with this title, Lucifer? It comes through the stories of the fallen angels. The story of Apollo, who I just mentioned, is said to have built a foundation and altar on Delos using the horns of the goats that his sister Diana hunted. Apollo is said to have invented the lyre and along with Artemis the art of archery and then taught humans the art of healing and archery. This idea of a god teaching humans knowledge would be considered evil. It is directly connected with the serpent in the garden telling Adam and Eve that they can be like gods if they take a bite of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the book of Enoch, angels fallen from heaven teach mankind the arts of metal making, healing, root cutting, etc. You might be surprised to know that there is no Satan in Enoch. Satan is not the fallen angels in Enoch. It is Azazel and Samael. Azazel is the scapegoat. During Yom Kippur, one goat who represents Azazel and another goat in Leviticus 16. Two male goats are to be sacrificed to Yahweh and one of the two was selected by Lot. For Yahweh is seen as speaking through the Lot's. One goat is selected by Lot and sent into the wilderness for Azazel. This goat was then cast out into the desert as a part of Yom Kippur. The scapegoat ritual can be traced back to the 24th century BCE of Ebla, from where it spread throughout the ancient Near East. This was a pagan tradition from the ancient Canaanites. There is an, another Canaanite deity, an heir of mythology, known as Ezesos. He is the equivalent of Phosphoros, the morning star, portrayed riding a camel in the desert. He was venerated in Syria as Lucifer. So now we have this goat, scapegoat god, identified with Pan, is an underworld chthonic deity, and there's a pun on a Luciferian god named Azizos. Apollo, who is the beautiful god of music and beauty and knowledge, being cast down to earth 
and punishment by Zeus. This is what is later borrowed for the story of Lucifer, especially in Islam. You also have, as I mentioned, with Anki and Enlil, you have the story of Prometheus, who tells mankind and humans how to build fires and how to be like the gods. He is also punished and chained to a rock. These stories of rebel gods who want to tell humans how to be like gods are what shapes the myth of Lucifer. There is no myth of Lucifer falling from heaven in any Judeo-Christian text ever. This is a later memory, if you will. It's a later collective memory that people put onto Lucifer through these other myths like Prometheus and Apollo and Diana Luciferia. You might be saying, but what about Isaiah? In Isaiah 14, 12, how have you fallen from heaven, morning star, son of dawn? In some translations, it says Lucifer. You have ca been cast down to earth. You who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the clouds. I will make myself the most high. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. This chapter of Isaiah was literally meant the king of Babylon, who was taken and cut down by the Persians, where he says in verse 3, On this day the Lord gives you relief from your suffering and turmoil, from the harsh labor forced on you. You will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon, not Lucifer, but the king of Babylon. How the oppressor has come to an end, how his fury has ended. The Lord has broken the rod of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers, which in anger struck down peoples with an unceasing blows and fury subdued nations with relentless aggression. And the lands are at rest and peace. They break into singing. Even the junipers and the cedars of Lebanon gloat over you and say, now that you have been laid low, no one comes to cut us down. The realm of the dead below is all astir to meet you at your coming. They are talk, Isaiah is talking about the king of Babylon, but he's using the imagery of Lucifer, the highest, the most brightest star in the sky in Canaanite mythology. He's using the greatness of Lucifer, something to compare how great the king of Babylon was. This passage of Lucifer falling gets linked up with all these pagan stories of all these light bringers and gods that rebelled. And you have now the foundation of a fallen Lucifer in the text of Isaiah. Ezekiel 8, 14 through 16 has a interesting passage that I want to relate to you right now. It says, then he brought me to the entrance of the gate of the Lord's temple, which faced the north. That's where I saw women seated, weeping for Tammuz. And then he asked me, do you see this, son of man? You are about to see even more detestable practices than these. Now, what does this mean? Weeping for Tammuz is a tradition that transcends all the pagan myths. The weeping for the dead god, like Adonis, or Attis, or Osiris. And sometimes it's weeping for Persephone. This is such a central thing to the idea of Lucifer and Satan. Because what you are seeing now is the idea of these pagan rites as detestable and abominations. Ezekiel is telling the reader that these are the rites that are infecting the Jewish tradition, you start to see this split between Judaism and paganism, which brings us 
to the story of Jezebel and Elijah. Jezebel worships Baal and Asherah. Baal, who used to be the son of El, another dying and rising agricultural deity of paganism, and her prophets of Baal cannot defeat Elijah, who is sending down fire from Uranus. This tradition depicts the triumph of El over Asherah and Baal, whereas Asherah and Baal later get identified with Isis and Serapis, Baal Hamon and Serapis. There is also a Pergamum altar. The altar of Pergamum worships these deities along with horned Zeus Amon, which is why in Revelation 2, you get, I knew where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith to me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who has put you to death in your city where Satan lives. This was an altar built by Augustus in honor of Zeus Amon and Isis and Serapis, who are depicted as serpents. Baal Zebub, Lord of the Flies in Hebrew. One of the epithets for Zeus and Pergamum is Epomnos. Zeus Epomnos is the god of the flies, the god of the dead, the underworld chthonic Zeus. That's who Baalzebub is, who shows up in the Gospels and is cast out by Jesus. Which brings us back to Christianity and Enoch. Enoch's Fallen Angels, a monotheistic retelling of the pagan traditions as fallen angels. This brings us to the author of Revelation, borrowing heavily from the Enochic tradition. The Great Serpent, or Satan, as in Revelation 12 tells us, is literally paganism incarnate. He is the light bringer, like Apollo and Diana, who also are cast down from heaven. He is the rebel, like Prometheus, who teaches mankind knowledge. He is the serpent in the garden, who tells you that you can be like gods if you take a bite. He is Bacchus, the spirit that possesses one. He is the Chthonian Hades, the king of the underworld. He is the Saturn king who eats his children. And most of all, he is the image of Pan, the goat god, who lives in the labyrinth and the underworld. And he is Venus, Lucifer, the morning star. These ideas continue after Christianity has a stronghold on the Romans. Baphomet, for example, becomes the Sabitic goat god who is worshipped by the Crusaders. Raymond Aguilaris reports that the term Baphomet comes from a corruption of the word Mahomet or Muhammad. Somehow this in initiation rite of the Templars is about this goat god, Baphomet. Jules Michelet says that the indictment published by the court of Rome set forth that in all provinces they had idols, that is to say, heads, some of which had three faces, others but one. Sometimes it was a human skull that in their assemblies they had especially in their grand chapters, they worshiped the idol as a god, as their savior, saying that this head could save them, that it bestowed on the order all its wealth, made the trees flower, and the plants of the earth sprout forth, which is a pagan agricultural idea. Dante in his Inferno plays off of this and also depicts Satan with three heads, just as 
Miss Shillet describes them of Baphomet. And then when we get to Paradise Lost by John Milton, the entire image of Lucifer and Satan is put together perfectly. The fall of man, the temptation of Adam and Eve by the fallen angel Satan, who is also the serpent, and the Luciferian angel. All of it is put together in 1667 by John Milton, who later is picked up by Aleister Crowley and the painting, famous depiction of the Baphomet by Eliphas Livy, depicting this god with the staff of the serpents of Mercury and the pentagram on his head, which is the symbol of the pagan altar, the horns of the goat, the wings of the fallen angel Lucifer, and of course, he is male and female, like Venus and Lucifer. Aleister Crowley uses the Baphomet of Levi within his cosmology of Thelema, the mystical system established by Crowley in the 20th century. Baphomet features in the creed of the Gnostic Catholic Church, recited by the congregation, the Gnostic Mass, in the sentence, and I believe in the serpent and the lion, mystery of mysteries, in his name, Baphomet. This is where we now have all of these sigils of Baphomet and Lucifer in the Satanic Temple, which is still alive today as a direct opposition to the biblical religions that seek to suppress the human condition of fleshly desires, of seeking knowledge, of progression. So my conclusion is that Lucifer and Satan is the embodiment of the pagan tradition itself in a direct opposition to the biblical God. And it's also a realization that you cannot unify ancient religions into one religion. You have to choose. Either you want the Messiah to come and bring in this one world submission to one God, or you reject that idea and instead put up on a throne to worship the world, human growth, and desires, which is not evil and is natural, to take care of Mother Gaia and not wait for its destruction by a messiah. Let me know what you think in the comments. You have just attained true gnosis.